Yes, I know, it's weird that I've never seen this before. Hey, I'm Amy and welcome or welcome back and today I will be checking Monty Python and the Holy Grail of the 1001 Movie Checklist. If you don't know what the 1001 Movie Checklist or 1001 Movie Challenge is, it is basically a challenge I have given myself to watch every single movie from the 1001 Movies You Must See Before You Die book. So far, I have checked 155 movies off the list. If you want to know more about this challenge, you can watch the intro video there or just a playlist of every single movie I have watched so far. I am also an Amazon affiliate, so if you would like to start the challenge for yourself, watch the movie I'm talking about today, or get ready for the next one, check out the links in the description below. If you purchase anything from those links, I will get a little bit of a kickback and it'll help make this channel a whole lot better. As always, let's get started with a short summary. In a tongue-in-cheek take on the classic tale, King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table embark on a quest from God to find the Holy Grail, encountering hilariously silly obstacles along the way. In this series, I love to do a little bit of research, get some behind-the-scenes information on how the film has been made, or just some fun, interesting facts on any of the crew or cast members. And the book holds a lot of that information, sometimes not so much, but in this case, the book had some very fun, well, not fun, kind of interesting behind the scenes drama that happened within the making of Monty Python and the Holy Grail. As everyone knows, Monty Python was originally a comedy sketch series on BBC called Monty Python's Flying Circus that included five hilarious British men, John Cleese, Michael Palin, Eric Idle, Terry Jones, and Graham Chapman, and one American, Terry Gillum. And after the surprising success of Monty Python's Flying Circus, the group thought, why not make feature films? And the first of many, Monty Python and the Holy Grail, was born. Although this film was very hilarious and successful, there were some behind the scenes woes, including Graham Chapman was at the very peak of his alcoholism, and it kind of rendered him, when he was playing the lead role of King Arthur, almost incomprehensible and unable to say his lines once the camera was rolling. Uh, so uh, anything that you could do to, uh, to help would be very helpful. And another major, major point was that co-directors Terry Gillum and Terry Jones had very, very different ideas of what the style of the movie should be, which I will talk about the style a little bit later on. But Gillum, who did the animation for Monty Python's Flying Circus, really resented Jones for, and this is a direct quote from the book, reduced the grandeur of his set designs with the cramped camera setups, which you can really tell in some scenes where it has a very odd looking angle like this one. To the north there lies a cave, the cave of Kyr Banog, wherein, carved in mystic runes upon the very living rock, the last words of Ulf and Bedway are of- So now some of my thoughts and a little bit of a breakdown, as usual. The comedy in this is just so good. It is a textbook for what British humor is. You can look at this and pull out pretty much every single stereotype of British humor, mainly making a satire out of the absurdity of everyday life. They also put a big focus on the class system. I'm Arthur, King of the Britons. Whose castle is that? King of the who? The Britons. Who are the Britons? Well, we all are. We are all Britons. And I am your king. I didn't know we had a king. I thought we were an autonomous collective. You're fooling yourself. We're living in a dictatorship a self-perpetuating autocracy in which the working classes... Oh, there get... you go, bringing class into it again! Well, Make a ton of innuendos and are not shy about sexual taboos. The beds here are warm and soft and very, very big. Well, look, I... I what is uh, your name, handsome knight? A Sir Galahad, the chaste. Mine is Zoot. Just Zoot and make a ton of intellectual jokes that, even though this movie was made in the 1970s, 1975, are still hilarious to this day. They just really make you think about the jokes and I absolutely love it. That is one of my favorite types of comedy where you kind of have to think. You can't just be handed the joke. It can't just be explained to you. And if it's explained to you, it's not as funny, but if you understand it, it's just pure hilarity. One of my favorite things in comedy is the long take and somewhat improvised takes, which they did a lot in Monty Python and I absolutely adored it. Probably one of my favorite scenes is the scene in the Swamp Castle where the king is talking to the guards and it just goes on. I can't even show the entire clip because of copyright. I do really, really love just 
how smooth it feels even though I do believe that some of this probably is improvised. I feel like they were very great with improvisation, the Monty Python crew. It's so brilliant. It's just a camera on sticks and they're shooting the scene and it's hilarious. No, no, you stay in the room and make sure he doesn't leave. And you'll come and get him. Yes. Right. We don't need to do anything apart from just stop him entering the room. No, no, leaving the room. Leaving the room, yes. All right? And now, like I promised, the stylization of this movie. It is very stylized. It has multiple different styles. The main one is the mixing of mediums, which is what Gillum and Jones both butted heads over for the most part. Even though in Monty Python's Flying Circus, a lot of the sketches were intercut with Gillum's drawings and illustrations and paper animations, this was kind of the same thing. They used a lot of Gillen's animations within this as a storytelling device, but also cutting between different parts of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table's journey. Winter changed into spring. Mm, nice. Spring changed into summer. Mm. Summer changed back into winter. And winter gave spring and summer a miss and went straight on into autumn. <sighs> And they also mix the style of storytelling, mainly being narrative, but they do have this really weird, funny documentary style that is cut in between some parts of the main narrative journey that ends up being part of the narrative journey. And the way that they use this documentary style to kind of pull the entire movie together in the end is so great, so funny, and so weird, and it just makes the movie end super abruptly. Like, the entire thing was just this big meta group of friends trying to make this movie and it gets shut down. And also goes along with my next point of breaking the fourth wall. They don't do it a whole lot, but when they do, it's so funny. Do you think this scene should have been cut? We were so worried when the boys were writing it. But now we're glad. It's better than some of the previous scenes, I think. At least ours was better visually. At least ours was committed. It wasn't just a string of pussy jokes. Get on with it. Yes, get on with it! Yeah! There were so many iconic scenes from this movie for me to choose from for the clip for this, but there was one that just stuck out to me because of the way and the timing that John Cleese delivers his line. It was just so perfect. I was laughing the entire time. What makes you think she is a witch? Well, she turned me into a newt. A newt. I got better. Burn her anyway! Burn! And that's all I have for Monty Python and the Holy Grail. As always, these are just my opinions, but I'd love to know yours in the comments down below. Let me know what you thought. Which Monty Python movie is your favorite? Life of Brian is also on the list. I have not seen that yet either, so I will probably be watching that soon. Not next week, but I will be watching it soon. If you want to know which films I have already watched or just follow my progress along in general, there's a link to a Google Doc in the description with a list of every single movie I have checked off so far. The next episode will be the first one in the month of scary movies that I'm planning on doing for October. I did this last year and I had so much fun. I'm going to be doing it again this year. So I'll be watching two scary movies or scary, two kind of horror-y movies for my 1001 challenge. And the first one will be one that I know a lot about, but I have never seen it. It'll be one of the very few movies on this list that I know a lot more about than I actually usually like going into these movies knowing. But it's just such an iconic movie in the pop culture lexicon because, I mean, it was probably everyone's favorite movie or probably everyone's favorite scene in the Ready Player One movie. So you probably know what movie I'm going to be talking about. It is a movie that I have never watched before because I'm a huge scaredy cat. So in two weeks, I will be checking off The Shining. Yes, Stanley Kubrick's The Shining based on the Stephen King novel. It's going to be terrifying and a blast. 
at the same time. But thank you guys so, so much for watching. I really, truly do appreciate every single one of you. Let me know who you are in the comments down below and let's be friends. If you enjoyed this, leave a like and subscribe if you're new because I love talking about things, movies, TV shows, filmmaking, film history, all that fun stuff, and I'll see you next time. Bye.